Today we are going to examine what is probably the oldest cookbook in medieval Europe, or very nearly so. It exists in four different manuscripts. Two are in Low German, one in Danish, and one in Icelandic. They can be dated somewhere around 1300 or maybe even a little earlier. It's called the Libellus de Arte Coquinaria, and as you can probably tell, the title and the recipe titles themselves are in Latin. Now what this suggests is that it's a translation of an older work that no longer exists and was written out uh, for a variety of patrons who wanted to serve elegant meals with imported ingredients. And by imported, I mean in particular spices that came from India and what's now Indonesia, things like cloves and cinnamon and nutmeg and pepper. And these traveled across the entire known world to get to Iceland, which had just been settled by Vikings a few centuries before. Now clearly, they had kept up trade contacts with mainland Europe. Now in many respects, these recipes resemble those of later, better-known medieval cookbooks, like the form of curry in England, and even the Libre de saint Sauvi in Catalonia. That's because medieval aristocratic cuisine was very international. There was a small landed military elite who mostly wanted to imitate each other. They were rarely educated, so I can imagine these were the kind of texts that might have been copied out by a clergyman or a learned secretary and brought to these far-flung courts with explanations on how to use these exotic ingredients. And at the end of one of the manuscripts, the translator, or maybe even the copyists, wrote in Latin, this little book on culinary art is finished. Thanks be to God, let the copyist go play, amen. <laughs> and you can, you can almost picture this person sort of dictating in, in, his, in his monk's cowl, you know. And the recipes themselves are terse. Um, they have no literary pretensions, and so we will have almost completely free hand with the measurements and the cooking times, exactly as a medieval cook would, who probably, you know, heard these read out loud and had to then figure out how to prepare them. And his master may very well have been among those who maybe went to the Holy Land, fought in the Crusades, made it home now, and wanted some reminder of his adventure. And what better way than a thick, spicy sauce to go in his haunch of flesh? And there are also internal clues that suggest that this is meant for a noble audience. Interestingly, the recipes are all for meat, fowl, and fish, and then sauces to go with them. There's no fruit <laughs> or vegetables, and people sometimes assume, oh, that must mean because medieval people didn't eat them. Um, and it's true, actually, physicians warned people about the cold, phlegmatic humors that could arise from fruits especially. But I think their relative scarcity in cookbooks is more that these were not really items of prestige or luxury, especially if you could grow them at home. But almonds, on the other hand, those are imported from the South, and they feature here, especially almond milk, which was used uh, during Lent and fasting days as a milk substitute. That's not a modern invention, surprisingly enough. So I'd like to point out that the language of some of these manuscripts is very close to Old English. And a speaker of modern English can almost make out what they mean. For example, man skaltakai brazen ok gadai ok ale fiskai and stacker them well. One should take uh, bream and pike or other fish and roast them well. Now what exactly the author means by roast should not be confused with baking. Though there are recipes for pies, they also have oven technology and baked bread, but I think by the roast, what, he, what we would think of as grilling. On the other hand, as you'll see, the sauce is made from the drippings, so I think this, this should be in a pan over a fire, what's called hunter-style fish, and obviously you don't hunt for fish. So I think this means the sort of dish that could be prepared easily and quickly outdoors, while on the hunt, of course, which is exactly what a nobleman did when not fighting wars. So the recipe also says to baste with the oil mentioned earlier, and what, um, that's the base for the sauce. Uh, the only oils that are mentioned before are walnut oil or almond oil. Both are actually made from scratch by pounding the nuts and wringing out the, the oil through a cloth. And again, the logic is that these would be appropriate for Lent. So we're gonna baste the fish while it's roasting with the oil, and when that's done, we'll, we're told to take of the oil and blend it with vinegar and wring it through a cloth, in other words, where we're straining out any solid bits. And as for the type of vinegar, it seems unlikely that this would be uh, 
vine-based, you know, wine vinegar, since that would have to be imported um, uh, this far north. So it doesn't seem likely that they would import olive oil since they're making nut oil. So my guess is that it's made from something, either beer or apple cider, or maybe even mead. Um, combined with the nut oil, these make a really interesting dressing, but not an expensive one. And this is a recipe you can easily do away from home. Now the question is why would they be using imported spices but not oil and vinegar. And I think it must be that the, the weight and a, the long distance wouldn't really make uh, these profitable. Um, though we know they certainly imported wine, and in fact, even in Beowulf, they drank ale, mead, and on a few occasions, wine. And interestingly, everything goes wrong when they drink wine, which is a, you know, a foreign kind of drink. But let's compare that one to a recipe for mustard. And we're told to grind the mustard seeds and add a third part of honey and a tenth part of anise and twice as much of cinnamon. And regarding the provenance here, the mustard and the anise, they actually can be grown in Europe and obviously the honey too, but it's the cinnamon that comes from what is now Sri Lanka that makes this a noble dish. The herbs are ground, mixed with the vinegar, and put in a cask, and it will last three months. And many of the recipes seem concerned about how long you can keep a dish or a sauce around. And I'm not really sure why you would need to make this in advance, though it's a really interesting mustard and maybe um, you know, it might even improve with age, but the, but the sauce for Lord includes these things, cloves, nutmeg, cardamom, pepper, cinnamon, ginger, toasted bread, vinegar, uh, and this one lasts for half a year. So now we're gonna cook from the Libellus, and it will seem strange primarily because it's a pie, but it has bones in it. Now keep in mind, uh, were meant to be, uh, they were meant to be a form of preservative, the pie itself, I mean. The sealed dough keeps out the oxygen. And these are medieval recipes. Um, sometimes they have a deer inside. I've seen some with oyster shells and everything. So these can be used to make pasties of fish or fowl or actually anything. But this one specifies a young chicken. Um, and we could cut it in two, we could keep it whole, which, whichever way, I'll, I'll leave that to you. But I think you could easily use a little game hen, that's what we found for this, and uh, it'd be very pleasant serving for one person, just a tiny little pie with a game hen inside. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this little chicken and we're gonna cover it with the, um, the sage leaves. And I just have some fresh sage here. Um, and of course you would wanna salt it, right? doesn't specify that, but salt in and out, and maybe even put some sage leaves inside the cavity, like that. And then I'm gonna wrap, take, just take off the stems, put some sage in like that. Just leave these whole. And then, I'm gonna wrap this in bacon, okay? And they don't, I don't know what exactly kind of bacon they had, but this will do fine. I'm gonna bring that over here. I think three, maybe, let's give it one more. Why not be generous? Okay, put that aside. Okay, so for this recipe, I'm going to use rye. Um, I think it's appropriate for the region, Northern Europe and Scandinavia and Iceland, of course, but also because rye was used um, in these early pies uh, because it doesn't break when you bake it. Um, and the pie, this is gonna be really strange, doesn't include fat. Um, and that's led most scholars to conclude that the crust wasn't actually eaten, that it's just kind of a, a coffin, a coffer to hold all the contents and act as a preservative. So it's really kind of odd. Through the course, we're gonna actually follow different types of pies and see how they're made. Um, eventually they will have a fat in them, eventually butter will go in. So we'll see that that evolution happen very slowly and interestingly. But to start with, it's not a, um, it's not an edible crust, probably. Although, you know, once you put it in here and it's got the bacon and everything, I think it probably will taste very good. And my sort of, you know, experience with all this seems to say, well, if someone's gonna go to the expense of growing um, a grain, are you really gonna throw it away? And <laughs> throw away the crust, you're gonna make it, you know, as edible as you possibly can. So, so let's just make this crust for this. And I'm gonna wrap it in this, and there's really not much more to it, but let me, uh, 
show you how to make a, a fairly simple medieval pie. Early medieval pie, I should say. Uh, by the time we get to the, it's really not until the 15th century that you find butter in, in the crust and something that looks like a crust that we would eat. Um, and then sometimes lard and sometimes suet or other type of fat, but this doesn't have it in there at all. Okay, I'm not sure this is going to be big enough. I mean, you do want this fairly thick, so it's not going to fall apart, but let's see. Will this cover our little bird? will work. Okay. And the sides. And we're just going to need a little top for this. Right on top. And actually I have one little part here that came out. Let me just fix that. So you want this nicely sealed up. So this would normally be baked right on the floor of a brick oven, um, but you could use a baking stone, that's what I've got in there to get the same effect, um, or put a piece of parchment down. I've put this into a um, baking pan just because I think it's gonna probably leak some grease from all that bacon and I don't want it to go into the floor of the oven. But the, um, but the, the uh, dough, of course, is gonna take the shape of the chicken. And the beauty of this dish is that normally if you were to bake a chicken, all the juices would just run out and you'd have, you'd have to make a sauce from those, like right, a modern baked chicken if you throw it in the oven. But here, we'll let this cool down to room temperature after baking, and the juices should remain um, within and be absorbed by the dough. And I think it might actually be edible. We'll see what happens. But for the moment, I'm going to put it in the oven, and I'm going to give this at least an hour um, to bake. And I think, because uh, we want the bacon to cook through and the whole chicken and everything together. So into the oven it goes. To go with these recipes, I'd like to walk you through a fascinating archaic technique. I know a lot of people do really serious home brewing nowadays, and most people either buy the um, malted barley or they might buy a pre-made liquid wort and very reliable yeasts and hops and use all sorts of fancy equipment and airlocks and things like that to uh, make, make the beer um, taste good, right? <laughs> and that's exactly what we'll not do in this uh, episode. I've done this a few times, and actually the first time I did it with a, a kit from uh, the Chemist Boots in England when I was only 13 years old. That was my first batch of beer. And um, the kits are fine, but rarely as good as what the pros can do. So I think, you know, the same thing is true with wine. And it's, you know, wine is actually much easier to make. I do that with grapes uh, every fall. Uh, it's just a few bottles are pressed by hand, but I think, um, you know, beer is a lot more complicated. Um, and what I want to capture here is, is something um, that readers of the Libellus would have had in the 13th century in northern Germany or Denmark or even in Iceland. And to start, the one big difference is that they would have used wild yeast. Uh, and we're going to do that too. Um, they didn't use hops at this point either. Uh, more common was a mixture of herbs called kraut, and it's actually the same word as kraut, which means just vegetables. It would usually contain mugwort, that's Artemisia vulgaris, which is a bitter and acts as a preservative. Um, maybe also they'd add yarrow or henbane, which is hallucinogenic, and a whole series of other herbs which were actually kept a secret because someone was granted the exclusive right to sell this kraut 
uh, for to the beer makers. But we're, we'll just stick with stick with mugwort, and as you can tell from the name in English, it's for the mug. It's for ale, right? Um, a few other things to keep in mind: through most of the Middle Ages, beer was made in the home on a very small scale, and almost always by women.、Uh, in England, this would be called the alewife. Who might run a small operation out of her kitchen,、um, or maybe even a small tavern-like operation?、Uh, gradually, commercial operations increased in scale, and once they started using hops, they could actually ship beer much further. It was done,、um, say, in the Hanseatic League cities in Germany, up through the Baltic Sea, and then finally, the Dutch also get very good at large-scale professional brewing. Another thing to keep in mind is this was not the light lager that we're familiar with, which is you know bottom fermented in a cold cellar. This is actually top fermented, meaning the yeast will be floating on top.、Um, so we would call this ale. To start with, we also need to malt the barley, and for this you need whole grains, not pearled barley, but what looks like this is just barley. Okay, and to make the malt, what we're going to do is just soak these in water overnight. I'm just going to fill this. Whole thing. This is about two and a half pounds of barley.、Um, so obviously, I'm making it on a very, very small scale. This is going to make—I don't know how much. It may be a get, couple of gallons.、Um, we're just going to soak this, and then in the next morning, you will drain this off, and then keep changing the water every, for about two or three days.、Um, I also gave you some、um, wheat here, just so you can see the difference. Wheat is looks. Very, very different from barley. It's、uh, much smaller, and you can use wheat to make、um, beer. But the barley actually changes the enzyme when it's sprouted. Will actually、uh, help to convert the starches in the grain into sugar.、Um, so you want to keep them not too wet.、Uh, and then the sprout end, you can see if you look at these very closely, they have little rootlets that are sticking out of them, and they also have a sprout. Okay, that's in there. So this has just been three days sitting.、Um, you can see they're still just a little moist.、Um, I just kept them in the house, so you don't have to put this outside or anything. And there's one has just escaped. But you can see. So when the when the root end is about the same size as the grain itself, you can see that right there. Then that's ready to make、uh, into malt. And you could also actually add oats. Sometimes rye is added to it, or wheat, and that's going to give it a different flavor, darker color. So in、um, Northern Europe, this would have been done over a very low flame with smoke,、um, and that would, of course, flavor the beer exactly as it does in whiskey.、Um, and of course, you know, whiskey is just basically distilled beer. So what I suggest you should do is put it in the oven at about 200 degrees and leave it overnight, and it will completely dry out. But you don't want to actually cook the grains through, or else you prevent the next stage from working properly. So they should just get lightly, lightly toasted, and the level that you will make that malt will、um, will of course determine the color of the beer. And so let's let's、uh, just try to malt this right now. I'm going to put this on a very low heat, and all I really want to do is toast these. I think maybe I can fit this whole thing in there. We just want to stir this around until it gets nice and toasty, and then we're gonna grind it up. Okay, I think that's just as much as that's gonna handle for the moment. To make sure I'm not burning them. You know what? I think I'm gonna get a second pan going. And if you can smell this, it's already getting this lovely toasty <laughs> aroma. How interesting! The person who does this would be called a maltster, <laughs> and they would their job would be to rake, you know, a ton of malt, a ton of grain at a time. And the advantage of this is that once it's actually parched like this. You can make、um, beer any time of year, so it's very different from wine. Wine you'd need to make when the harvest is ready. Everyone has to, you know, you have to press all the wine and put it in bottles or, or casks to start with.、Um, this is very different. You can actually keep the malted barley around, which is, I think, why, you know, most、um, home brewers buy malted barley or they buy what's called the wort, which we'll、um, we'll get to in just a few minutes. But let's watch this process carefully. Some of them are actually already getting a little toasty. Maybe there.
Okay, I'm gonna take these off now. I'm gonna set up this hand mill right here. This basically replicates a hand kern, which would have been used from prehistoric times, really, to grind wheat. Even before wheat was cultivated, <clears throat> people would use a rotary kern or hand kern like this, without the plastic handle, obviously. <laughs> have a, another bigger stone that sits on top of a sort of dome, and then you turn it, you know, with a stick or with a little uh, knob. But this is pretty much the exact same technology. It just has to be bolted down very well. Okay, so here is our malted barley, and I'm just gonna feed it into the hopper of this millstone. And as you can see, what's coming out here is very coarsely ground barley malt. I'm just going to poke it through the hopper to help it along. They probably, I mean, you could do this on a, in a big mortar and pestle as well if you didn't have a, a, a grindstone like this. And I imagine, you know, once you have animal power, you can make a much bigger millstone. You can hook up oxen to it or um, a horse if you have it. And then the whole process goes much, much quicker. But this is, I'm gonna just tighten that a little bit. Obviously with a hand mill, this is gonna take a long time. <laughs> so as you can see, this takes a really long time. I wonder how many calories you expend in doing this just to get the uh, beer in the end. But, uh, but you know, consider the beer, as a food. Uh, you know, this is something that men, women, and children would have eaten and um, gotten their calories from and been nourished by. So what we're gonna do at this point, with this remaining grain, is we're gonna put it into the, um, into this water. This water I boiled, I actually I didn't boil it, I brought it up to about 140 degrees. And that means so hot that you can't really put your finger in for more than a couple of seconds. You can see I can keep it in there for just about a second or so. Uh, but what's gonna happen is I'm gonna put this in here and let this sit for just an hour. So let me mark the time. But this basically sits for an hour and then this is strained through a cloth and then you pour more water at 140 degrees over the grain. This is called sparging, which will extract more sugars from the um, grains themselves. Now at this stage, what you have is called wort, W-O-R-T. Bring this up to the boil uh, with a little bit of the mugwort, which we have here, and whatever other herbs you'd like to use. Let them boil together for an hour, and then strain that to remove all the green stuff. And the final liquid you'll cool to room temperature and pour in a vessel big enough to hold it. We'll use this stainless steel here. A, a wooden barrel would be ideal, actually. And today, you would add, uh, at this point, some commercial yeast for the specific kind of beer that you want. In the past, they used yeast from a former batch, uh, or they used ambient yeast to just colonize the liquid, like you would do in a sourdough starter. And actually, if you have a sourdough starter, you can use one. I have one in the corner there. I'm probably going to use that. Um, and then, uh, you know, the next stage will depend entirely on the temperature in the room, how active the microbes are in your house. But eventually you'll notice these little bubbles rising and a beery aroma. And then at that point, you could actually bottle it, but it was not done in the past, not until like ooh, 15th, 16th century, until they had reliable bottles. It would usually go in a barrel. Um, and they drank it room temperature 
and flat. So it's, so it's a it's a surprising taste for Americans. I mean, we like cold fizzy beer, um, but um, you know it's actually still very good. It's very appealing. If you think of it more as food than than as a, a drink, refreshing drink, um, you'll also notice that the beer will come out very cloudy because we're not going to filter it as they didn't in the Middle Ages. So the yeast and other particles will still be in there, basically. So think of it as a kind of nutritious probiotic ferment of grain. <laughs> and this was the typical drink uh, for breakfast, actually, before you go out into the field to work. Men, women, and children all drank beer. It was much safer than drinking the water, usually. And there's um, you know, some argument among historians whether this was a really low alcohol, small beer, as it was called. You know, you might have uh, four or five percent of alcohol in this beer, depending on how concentrated the wort is. Um, and that's nowhere near like the strong hoppy IPAs you can buy nowadays that go up to 10%, but it's still enough to make you a little tipsy. And I think we ought to remember also the social context. Remember, no one is driving to work or answering the phone. So a little buzz while you're planting seeds or harvesting, that's you know entirely socially acceptable, even if it's not such a good idea to you know be swinging a sickle while you're, while you're a little drunk. But, but there are of course ritual occasions in the past when you could drink um, much more than that. The, the church, um, you know, also had a, a church ales or carnivals or feasts of saints days. They all involved drinking. And if you were a nobleman, you might drink beer during the day and then switch to a much more expensive imported wine later with dinner. So the distinctions in the patterns of consumption only increase the more trade expands in the later Middle Ages, the more luxury goods are brought in. Then you might have, you know, a Malvasia from Greece or something from the Canary Islands. But um, for most people, the average everyday drink from the Middle Ages, well, especially in Northern Europe, would just have been beer. So give it a shot on your own and see if it turns out as nicely as ours will. 